Boa tarde a todos e a todas. Obrigada por estarem aqui. Thank you for your presence. We are here to uh, listen to Professor Gay Zeidman. Uh, and it's my great privilege uh, to uh, introduce her to you today. Um, she is. Uh, she was an undergraduate at Harvard, a graduate at Berkeley, uh, and she presently teaches at the sociology department at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where she was a colleague and shared many interests with Eric Goldberg. Other than the sociology department, and this will give us an idea of her multiple interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary interests, Professor Seidman is also affiliated in development studies, African studies, Latin American, Caribbean and Iberian studies program, gender and women's studies department, Center for Demography and Ecology. Her major areas of work are political sociology, economic change and development, labor, class analysis and historical change, demography and ecology, social movements and collective behavior, gender, especially in the global south, South Africa and Brazil, but also Zimbabwe and Guatemala. Among other works, she has written a series of articles about the South African women's movement and about how gender issues have been built into South Africa's new democratic state. Other than articles in magazines such as Politics and Society, Third World Quarterly, Journal of Social Research, Feminist Studies, Science, um, she was also one of the editors of special issues like Nature, Raw Materials and Political Economy, um, of Research in Rural Sociology and Development, or the Socialist Review. Let me just name a few of her long list of titles. She co-authored Beyond the uh, Disciplinary Boundaries, Leveraging Complementary Perspectives on Global Labor and the Journal of Industrial Relations, Naming, Shaming and Changing the World, <coughs> Sage Handbook of Resistance, Divestment Dynamics, Globalizing, Shaming and Changing the Rules, Social Research, <coughs> The Femocrats Dilemma, Mobilization versus Representation in the South African Gender Commission, Feminist Studies, reprinted in a book, Africa to Gender, an interdisciplinary reader. Gendered Citizenship, South Africa's Democratic Transition and the Construction of a Gendered State in Gender and Society, republished in French, in Clio, a French um, uh, women's history journal. Uh, mainly of reference are her books, Manufacturing Militants, Workers' Movements in Brazil and South Africa, 1970-1985, and Beyond the Boycott, Labor Rights, Human Rights, and Transnational Activism. This one, the most recent one, focuses on social justice and state labor rights in an integrated world economy, the importance of stateless regulation, namely through transnational consumer boycott, boycotts, but also on the need to continue to pressure national governments and local labor organizations. The question of genderlessness is a big issue in all of these questions, and I'm sure Professor Zeidman will give us a lot to think about with our talk here today. So, genderless and inequality struggles, I give you Professor Zeidman. Thank you very much, Professor. That was very kind of you, although you left out my favorite title, which is Gorillas in Their Midst. <laughs> Um, so, I'm really happy to be here today. When Boa first invited me to speak in September, I was actually really reluctant to do this because Eric Olenright had been my colleague, my neighbor, and friend for 30 years, which is literally half my life. And um, when Boa suggested this, I actually was still trying to deal with his absence. And I have to say that even a year after his passing, Eric's, it's actually, it's a year today, um, Eric's absence leaves a gaping hole. An old colleague at Berkeley, Carol Hatch, used to say that Eric had the personality of a summer camp director. He was someone who pulled everyone around him into these joyous, productive games. He, he kept people going when things were bad. He could see the bright side of anything. He brought that energetic warmth to so many different activities, from canoeing on the Wisconsin River, to cross-country skiing on the lake, on the ice. <laughs> um, helping a friend who's got personal issues or a graduate student who needed financial aid. 
I never did make it on any of them. He did sociocultural bike tours of Madison every year, and I never managed to go on one of them. But um, there were these amazing dinners for visiting scholars, which we had some of. And um, these Thanksgiving feasts, he would always play the, the fiddle, and we would do the Virginia Reel graduation celebrations. Eric and Marcia's house really was the heart of a global community of scholars and activists. It was simultaneously close-knit and limitless, a community that those of us who are lucky enough to be part of it will always cherish. Uh, it is true that very few camp director, very few summer camp directors have ever been as brilliant as Eric. They, didn't have his intellect, they don't have his intellectual rigor, his insight, but I think Carol's description captures the kind of spirit that infused his intellectual work. His, his ability to point new directions, to pull us into new adventures, to build a better community. If you've read his work, you know how brilliant his insights could be, and how clearly he could spell out complicated issues or interrogate simple ones. In person, you could always count on him for thoughtful, reasonable responses, even to ideas that challenged his basic beliefs. Responses that were infused by a deep sense of generosity, a sense of social justice, and an egalitarian universalism. He could always find the gem in a student's dissertation pro proposal, no matter how rough. He could acknowledge a reasonable insight, even with arguments that he completely disagreed with. Or he could offer a way forward out of a stalemate in the debate. But by the late 1980s, Eric's focus had changed from the class analysis that he began with his earlier project, where he mapped kind of complicated capitalist employment relations, parsed nuanced understandings of class location, in the 1990s, he began looking for new social relations that would encourage egalitarianism so that fairness and generosity rather than exploitation and competition would shape communities. That move mystified me, like so many others. I first met Eric in the late 1980s when his work on contradictory class locations had already established him as a leading Marxist sociologist. Then in 1990, I joined the Madison faculty, largely at Eric's persuading. So I was right there when Eric embarked on what Michael Burrowboy calls the tale of two Marxisms. So what prompted Eric's turn away from what that scientific Marxism, that careful, data-based, analytic mapping of class structures and class locations? And why did he shift to searching for alternative social organizations and a new emancipatory project? That search for real utopias often seemed more idealistic than empirical, more philosophic than sociological. In fact, some of our more conservative colleagues in the department often ask whether Eric's Real Utopias project was really a return to his past. Because after he graduated from Harvard as an undergraduate, Eric attended a liberal religious seminary, and he served as a student chaplain in San Francisco's notorious San Quentin prison. Then he moved a couple years later to a doctoral program in sociology in Berkeley. So maybe this 1990 shift to Real Utopias was just a return to his more religious philosophical self. So in the years since Eric died, and especially since Boa asked me to write this paper, I've gone back to reread some of Eric's work in the early 1990s, as he began that shift. So increasingly, I'm convinced that this real utopias project really does stem from a sociological perspective, one that's informed by classical sociology, by deep egalitarian ideals, and above all, Eric's endless intellectual curiosity. But I'm also struck by how much Eric's new direction was shaped by a profound engagement with feminist theory, which is what I want to talk about today. Of course, I don't deny that this real world, this initial turn, as Fred suggested, was really prompted by real world events. Eric was quite clear that the collapse of the Soviet Union posed new theoretical challenges for Marxist theory and for sociology more broadly. When the only ex historical example of Marxist dictatorship of the proletariat fell apart, Eric argued that Marxists confronted a theoretical vacuum. Without an acceptable vision of what a more inclusive society might look like, what kind of a society should Marxists aspire to build? If actually existing socialism offers no guide to a better future, how should activists think about their goals? That question certainly nagged at Eric, who, although he did not consider himself a Weberian, always insisted on confronting an inconvenient fact. For decades, Eric participated actively in a group of social scientists who called themselves analytic Marxists, or as he would put it, the no-bullshit Marxists. A group of leftist scholars who prided, prided themselves on a direct engagement with, Marx, with mainstream economic theory and rational choice, trying to develop that scientific Marxism. 
For all of them, the collapse of the Soviet Union raised serious questions about what Marxists, sh Marxists should be focusing on, and even more, what it meant for Marxist Marxism's long-term vision of classlessness. But I think if you look at Eric's trajectory only in terms of Marxist theory, you overlook a second important dynamic. Feminist perspectives had become crucial to Eric's understanding of social relations in ways that shaped his understanding of social theory. I think it's clear that questions raised by feminists about what emancipation means and about how to get there shaped Eric's vision of real utopias. First of all, as anyone who knew Eric can tell you, his understanding of gender dynamics was shaped by his personal experience at home and at work. He grew up in a household marked by domestic egalitarianism. It, most unusually for someone who grew up in the 1950s, both his father and his mother were highly regarded professors of psychology. Then, as an undergraduate at Harvard, he met his life partner, Marcia. In fact, as sociologists, I have to tell you, they both took a course together with Talbot Parsons. <laughs> I don't think anyone who knows the family doubts that Eric's domestic life with Marcia and their two daughters, Jenny and Rebecca, strengthened his faith that a better world is possible and that gender inequalities would have no place in a real utopia. That conviction was also influenced by his interactions at work, especially with feminist graduate students and colleagues. Eric arrived in Madison in the late 1970s. Cindy Costello and other graduate students who were there insisted they pushed this junior faculty member to please include feminist theory in your sociological theory course. But Eric, unusually open to suggestions from students, asked the students to design an entire section of the course. So he incorporated, incorporated the, re the readings that his feminist graduate students proposed for the curriculum. In the process, several of those graduate students apparently formed an, a women's group, which is still meeting 40 years later. That openness continued throughout Eric's career. Some extraordinary graduate students came to, to Madison to work with him, including many socialist feminists like Janine Baxter, Rocca Ray, Elizabeth Wrigley Fields, many others. Working with students pushed Eric to ask me questions, as did broader collaborations with many leading feminist scholars, including Nancy Fulbright, Juliet Shore, Janet Gornett, Marcia Meyer, the list goes on and on. So thinking about that influence pushed me to start to look more closely at how in the early 1990s, Eric's growing appreciating of the impact of gender equality coincided with or even shaped his rethinking of scientific Marxism. Rereading his work from that period, it's clear that he began to think about the way socially constructed gender dynamics shape inequality at home as well as at work. And it pushed Eric to think differently about how social relations shape identities. Over time, that realization would, ask, would push him to ask how household dynamics as well as the workplace would have to change if people were ever going to live in the kind of ideal community that Marxists hoped for. That is, we would have to create a utopia that is genderless as well as classless. In retrospect, I think it's clear that even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, Eric was beginning to wonder how acknowledging inequalities beyond class would change Marxist dreams. In the late 1980s, he began asking basic questions about how gender shaped class, and his findings revealed unanticipated complications in Marxist assumptions. In 1989, he asked a new question. How might an increasing number of two-income households complicate the class structure of industrial society? How would, it, how would the fact that a growing percentage of women, of married women, were working outside the household affect our understanding of the relationship between the individual's work experience and class identity? Husbands and wives may hold jobs that confer very different status. For example, if one partner in the couple works in a full-time managerial job and the other works in a part-time flexible job, with less autonomy and less control. If there are two workers in the household, with each theoretically occupying a different class location, what shapes the individual's sense of class identity? Even more complicated, if a single male breadwinner no longer provides all the household income, why would the husband's job alone define the class location of all the members in the household? If a lower status worker's sense of their social standing is shaped by their husband's higher status, how will that worker understand her class position? Will her husband's status prevent her from developing true class consciousness? Eric's main question in this early work focused on how these two income households might complicate our understanding of class, based mainly on the way household members share property, wealth, and income. 
But as he compared Sweden and the US, Eric found that national context and state redistributed policies were critical to how class consciousness played out. In the United States, he wrote, the class character of the wife's job seems to have no effect on the class identification of either men or women. Respondents define their class position by household consumption levels, not by employment status. This led him to suggest a new concept, <coughs> mediated class locations, that would treat class location as shaped by property and social relations, as well as by employment. Since families are uni units of consumption, he wrote, the class interests of actors are derived in part by the total material resources controlled by the members of the family and not simply by themselves. By contrast, in Sweden, there were consistent effects of both husband's and wife's job class on the subjective identification of respondents. In Sweden, wives tended to contribute more to household income. Even more significantly, Eric pointed out, Sweden's welfare and redistributive policies allowed married women to feel less dependent on their husbands, which Eric suggested allowed married women, I'm sorry, allowed wives to construct their own identities independent of household status, and perhaps identities that were more aligned with their experiences at work rather than simply reflecting their husband's class status. In that first discussion of how gender relations might shape class identity, Eric didn't really present those results as surprising. But 10 years later, in his 1997 book, Class Counts, Eric would acknowledge that this first inquiry into how gender shaped class location had produced some of the few real surprises out of that large cross-national comparative study that defined the first half of his career. He wrote, I had not expected to find such pervasive and often dramatic interactions between class and gender. <coughs> My expectation had always been that class mechanisms would have more or less the same empirical effects for women as for men, but this is simply not the case. Who knew? Especially, he wrote, because gendered stereotypes often lead sociologists as well as employers to overlook and underestimate the skills that are required for women's work, such as child care or nursing. But even in 1989, the recognition that people understand their relationship to the larger class structure, not simply through their personal jobs or property, but through a variety of social relations, such as households, began to profoundly reshape Eric's thinking about class position. Adding gender, he wrote, complicates the simple polarized image of class structure contained in Marx's theoretical writings. By 1993, instead of understanding family relations through the lens of property, he began to suggest we need to recognize that individuals experience life, all individuals experience life, through networks of social relations. And we need to see those relations as central to people's lived experience, shaping our understanding of class. He suggested in a New Left Review article that Marxists need to recognize that people are linked to the class structure through social relations other than their immediate jobs. People live in families, and via their social relations to spouses, parents, and other family members, they may be linked to different class interests and capacities. This problem is particularly salient in households within which both husbands and wives are in the labor force, but occupy different job classes. A teacher married to a business executive has a different class location than a school teacher married to a, fac a factory worker. It is actually remarkable that that's the first time he had actually, 1989 was the first time he began to realize class location was just a little more complicated than an individual worker at the workplace. But this new concept, which Eric called mediated class location, reflects a fundamental rethinking of those basic categories, rooted in the recognition that class location is shaped by and shapes gendered family and household relations. It also raises larger questions about the dynamics of social change, about what our emancipatory goals would look like and what paths we might use to get to them. Those questions, again, were especially relevant in the 1990s, at a historical moment when, as Eric put it, many Marxists had come to doubt the feasibility of the most egalitarian forms of their historic emancipatory class project, particularly as a result of the fail I'm sorry, partially as a result of the failures of authoritarian state social systems, and partially as a result of theoretical developments within Marxism itself. These questions, I think, stemmed from a new theoretical insight. As Greta Krippner has recently said, an, an ever more complicated map of class structure made Eric less confident that class alone could provide the foundation for the emancipatory working class revolt envisioned by Marx, or even the emancipatory promise of a classless future. 
Eric had always been critical of authoritarianism, but by the 1990s, Eric was also uncertain about how classless societies could be organized. In a global economy dependent on complex industries and massive amounts of information, how could a classless society organize investment, production, or distribution without some kind of market-like mechanisms? Today, Eric wrote in 1994, relatively few Marxists still believe that class analysis alone provides a sufficient set of causes for understanding the historical trajectory of capitalism. And even fewer feel that this historical trajectory is such that the likelihood of socialism has an inherent tendency to increase with capitalist development. In other words, if you think that we live in a complicated society with complicated technology, can you really imagine classlessness as a way to organize? How do you imagine what a classless society would look like? Feminism offered a different path. At a moment when Marxists were beginning to doubt that socialism would be the inevitable outcome of class conflict, or even whether a classless society could sustain itself, feminists were far more confident that a better world is possible. Eric wrote, in contrast to Marxist angst over how to reach society without exploitation, or what that society would even look like, no feminist imagined that male domination in even vestigial form is essential for social life. <laughs> Moreover, he said, feminists might disagree about whether gender inequality stems primarily from cultural or sexual practices, or whether inequality is rooted in economic and political institutions of power and privilege, but he said, there is virtual unanimity among feminists about the possibility of eventually eliminating differences in power based on gender. Importantly, Eric argued, feminist unanimous agreement that society without gender oppression would be better for everyone was rooted in his lived experience, in sharp contrast to Marxist visions of a post-capitalist utopia where the very economic relationships that created ruling class would be abolished. Under capitalism, he wrote, prefigurative emancipatory experiences are not between workers and capitalists, but exclusively among workers. The solidarities experienced in the interpersonal practice of, practices of class struggle and in the micro settings of the labor process do not translate in any simple way into the institutional mechanisms of planning, information flows, allocation of capital, or price setting. That is, militant workers have no experience of close collaborations with managers or engineers, but equally problematic they may not be confident that a revolutionary working class could keep the factories running without them. By contrast, feminists experience solidarity and cooperation in their daily lives, in the real world, with women, and crucially, sometimes with men. In fact, at this moment, I have to acknowledge that although I made these slides, it was my husband that had the brilliant suggestion that I use the posters from his office. <laughs> the women's movement creates a, a range of solidarities among women, which prefigure a society in which women are not dominated by men. Even more importantly, Eric noted, women have male children whom they nurture. Boys have mothers whom they love. Even between husbands and wives within traditional patriarchal relationships, there are elements of reciprocity and companionship which prefigure the potential for egalitarian relations. In other words, while Marxist feminist and militant work, I'm sorry, while Marxist theorists and militant workers could only imagine classlessness, feminist daily experience offer obvious evidence that another world is possible. Eric's description of feminist solidarity says a lot about his values and experiences, as well as about his commitment to an egalitarian community. But it also inspired his commitment to finding real utopias, to model a world beyond capitalism. It was feminist lived experience of solidarity, he argued, that gave them faith in the possibility of an egalitarian future as well as confidence that they could build on existing relationships to get there. So this shift to the Real Utopias project in the late 1980s went through two phases. Phases, I would argue, were both informed by a comparison between classlessness and genderlessness. First, Eric began to think more critically about the dynamics of social change, especially about Marxist assumptions that class consciousness would automatically produce a revolutionary pro proletariat, which would automatically overturn all existing relations of production. In a widely cited article in the American Journal of Sociology in 2000, Eric acknowledged quite explicitly the limits to labor's demands in capitalist societies, building on his earlier insights into the realities of capitalist production. He acknowledged that workers in large industries can and do disrupt production when they want to demand higher wages or benefits. But he also recognized that even militant union members 
understand their livelihood depends on keeping their employer afloat, and that this dependency may limit workers' willingness to pursue what scientific Marxists would consider their true class interests. On the other hand, perhaps reflecting his increasing acknowledgement that cross-class relationships shape most people's lives, Eric began to acknowledge that the progressive labor movement often goes beyond the disruptive power of the workplace to build what he called associational power, recognizing that successful labor struggles, by definition, must involve community support. Labor activists seek to mobilize their neighbors to build solidarity across class lines, across lines of gender and race to demand far-reaching change. Structural power, as he said, as he called it, might give workers' organizations tactical strength, but associational power offers a much broader promise, demanding its expanding demands and vision of social change beyond a limited group of employees within a single workplace to offer a much larger community some hope. Thus, much as he had previously recognized that class location is mediated through individual social relations at home, Eric began to view social relations beyond the workplace as crucial to a more emancipatory movement. But what would that emancipatory movement look like, and how could activists persuade their communities that their demands are possible or realistic? Here again, feminism offered a model. Just as women's experiences of living and cooperating with men at home help strengthen their faith in the possibility of a better future, Eric argued that feminist care careful analyses of the specific day-to-day -day mechanisms that reinforce gender inequality allowed them to propose a wide range of social changes necessary to give women and men real power, from the public provision of childcare to labor market equality to a more equitable distribution of health care. In the 1990s, when he first discussed feminist policy proposals, Eric sounded rather dismissive of what he considered the <coughs> tendency among feminists to focus on pragmatic reforms rather than revolutionary change. But as he became more attentive to the value that most people place on their existing social relationships and on their communities, I think he became increasingly interested in looking at ways that you could advance egalitarian ideals through reforms and erosion of capitalism, rather than through the revolutionary chain that previously marked his vision. By the end of his career, those existing relations had become so central to his understanding of how a real utopia might take might take shape, that in his posthumous book, How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century, he really focused on changes that would assert and recreate the relationships that people found valuable. The value of community, he used the family as his main example. The value of community applies to any social unit in which people interact and cooperate. The family, in this sense, is a particularly salient community, and in a healthy family, one certainly expects cooperation to be rooted in both love and moral concern, prefiguring the strong concern and moral obligation that he believes shapes most religions, most vibrant communities, and all democratic social movements. By the early 2000s, that emphasis on community bonds, stemming from his awareness that individuals' identity and their happiness are shaped by the social ties that support them, his goal had shifted from revolutionary transformation to a path to utopia that would erode capitalism from within. Could social change come through a conscious effort to redesign economic and social dynamics, aiming to support a more cooperative, more egalitarian relationship in the here and now, <coughs> rather than waiting for a complete massive revolution? Over time, that became an even stronger argument, as Eric began to suggest maybe policies should explicitly push people <coughs> to behave better push parents to take parental leave to ensure they become engaged in childcare, and to promote equity at home and at work. Of course, most of the reforms he talked about, like um, universal the basic income, focused on economic and political institutions. But it's worth noting that the earliest examples described that in his earliest articles where he talked about institutional reforms, he went back to those Swedish policies of redistribution and um, support that helped, that actively rewarded households where parents, both, not just mothers, both parents, were involved in childcare. Just at a moment, historically, when families, our understanding of families was beginning to expand to non-traditional families, Eric also became a grandfather, and I think his emphasis on genderlessness in the <coughs> utopia ex expanded from his understanding of warm, egalitarian families 
which could offer a vision for a much broader kind of social change. By 2011, Eric's vision of a truly egalitarian society no longer contrasted a classless utopia to a feminist vision. Now, he suggested that utopia would have to be genderless as well as classless. Settling for gender equality, he argued, would risk leaving in place stereotypes that would impose socially, impose, socially enforced constraints on the choices and practices of men and women. Such constraints, he argued, thwart egalitarian ideals of a world in which all people have access to social and material means necessary to lead a flourishing life. A full degendering, degendering of family life, he wrote, would not mean removing all traits or behaviors considered masculine or feminine. Rather, it would remove any systematic expectation that those traits would correspond to physical characteristics. In a genderless community, norms around family roles would be con connected to parenthood rather than to specific gender roles. In any family, there might well be differences in the extent to which a specific individual took on particular responsibilities, but there would be no normatively backed expectations about who would do what. In other words, genderlessness. But above all, they would create they would embrace caregiving values and create strong positive norms about the general desirability of nurturance for everyone. As a sociologist, it's hard to disagree with Burrovoy's recent observation that Eric's genderless anti-capitalist vision of utopia is really as Durkheimian as it is Marxist, emphasizing the importance of community and social relations, both for individuals and for community as a whole. Of course, Eric was a sociologist, and Durkheim's recognition of the importance of social bonds is central to the discipline. But perhaps my conservative colleagues were also right. Perhaps Eric was always a religious seminarian at heart, a spiritually inclined camp director, offering a vision of a better world to inspire us in the present. But I would like to think that Eric's vision of a perfect society is equally a, refle a reflection of his own experiences as a husband and father as a member of the global community that he built, he nurtured, he enjoyed. A day or two before he died, Eric wrote that in his late teens or early 20, he, wanted to, he decided that he wanted to create meaning by trying to make the world a better place. I think all of us who knew him would agree that over the course of his life, he did exactly that. Typically for Eric, some of the last words he wrote underscore how love for family and community shaped his intellectual journey. And typically for Eric, he rejoiced in those warm and loving ties. Without being embedded in a social milieu where those ideas were debated and linked to social movements, I would never have been able to pursue this particular set of ideas. But I was enabled, and it's made for an incredibly meaningful and intellectually exciting personal life. So no complaints. I will die in a few weeks fulfilled, not happy that I'm dying, but deeply happy with the life I've lived and the life I've been able to share with all of you. In the end, Eric's real utopia was the world in which he actually lived, as a loving father, generous advisor and mentor, a dear friend. He will always be with us.